So Stewart is an Equal Fiscal Commissioner and has served as our counsel in this court case. Stewart is a professor of law and economics at the University of Ottawa and is the director of the university's Interdisciplinary Environment Institute. He is also the founder and chair of Smart Prosperity, a green economy think tank and policy research network. Stewart's environmental law expertise goes back to the beginning of his career where he litigated over the Valdez oil spill in Alberta. On return to Canada, he founded the project. Stewart has a master's of law from Harvard and a doctorate from Yale, uh, where his thesis was on carbon markets. Uh, we're very grateful for him to be here today to shine some light on the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal ruling. And without further ado, I will pass it on to Stuart. Thanks, Annette. Um, so, hi, everyone. I can't see you, um, but um, hopefully, yeah, I won't put anyone to sleep here. I want to give you an overview of the Saskatchewan decision last Friday. Let me confess up front that I'll have two hats. On the one hand, I'm, I'm a law professor and I write and research on environment and constitutional law. Uh, but my other hat is a litigator and I did litigate this case. So I will try and keep those roles separate and, and stick more to explaining. But if my inner advocate comes out, I hope you'll, you'll forgive me. Um, the Saskatchewan case was put as a reference question. So that means the government of Saskatchewan asked its Court of Appeal for its opinion on whether the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act was constitutional or not. Um, they had uh, 16 interveners in this case. There were three other provinces and then 13 different interests on both sides of the question. And one question I get asked a lot is, is, is this unusual to have these cases? And I'd say no. Most major federal environmental laws in the last 40 years have been challenged constitutionally. Uh, they've all been upheld. Sometimes it's been a split decision. So the fact that it's being challenged is not unusual. I'm going to go through um, four things. I'm going to talk about what the, uh, what the issues were, what the majority decided, what the dissenting judges said, and then what's next. And then we'll leave lots of time for questions. So. Uh, Constitutional Law 101 for the non-lawyers out there. The question is basically, is this act constitutional or not? Um, I suspect most people here know the basics of the law. It puts a national price on emissions, starting at $20 a ton, about four and a half cents a liter of gas, rising to $50 a ton by 2022. Um, for industry emitters, they have to pay a price on any emissions over a benchmark, which is set at what a, a highly efficient um, carbon efficient producer in that sector would emit. So it, it uh, charges a price on excess emissions for them. It takes a backstop approach. In other words, it sets a national minimum standard. If any province has its own pricing scheme equivalent to the federal price, federal law doesn't apply. And that's the case um, in most provinces. The backstop's been applied in, in four provinces, potentially five soon. Uh, and they took the approach of pricing and the act says in the preamble, because it's the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions. So let me shift now to just a really quick Constitution 101. Uh, in deciding whether or not a matter falls within the, the Constitution, the first thing a court has to do is decide what's, they use this word pith and substance, which really means what's the subject matter of the law. And then what you have to do is try to fit that subject matter into one of the heads of power in the Constitution. Uh, there's a federal list of powers in Section 91 and a provincial list in Section 92 that were mostly drafted in 1867 by the founders of Confederation. Not surprisingly, climate change or even pollution is not on that list. So you have to look by analogy to the different heads of power that are on there and see if this federal law fits by analogy with one of those heads of power. And then the third step is if you find that it does fit with a federal head of power, you look to see if there is a direct conflict between this federal law and a provincial law, and then there are rules for resolving that conflict, which I, we won't have to get into here because that issue didn't come up. So next slide. Um, what was argued? There were a number of different heads of power argued. The federal government relied primarily on its power, the peace, order, and good government power in the Constitution, and in particular what's called the national concern test of that power. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Saskatchewan challenged mainly under the taxation power. Their view was that this is, should fall under the federal government's tax power. Uh, and then interveners raised a variety of 
heads of power. The emergency power, which was used in times of war, was also used to uphold the Anti-Inflation Act in the 70s. Um, the power to implement treaties, the criminal law power, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit, and finally the trade and commerce power. So there were a roster of different options um, presented by different parties. The primary argument was though, about the, the peace order on good government power and the national concern branch of that power. And the, the case law establishes four different tests to decide if any subject matter fits within the national concern power. It has to apply these four tests. So the first is that the subject matter, and by the subject matter, it could be, for example, regulating greenhouse gases. I'll talk in a minute about the different subject matters that were argued, because those are actually crucial to the case. So the first test is, does this subject, is it a new matter, something that didn't exist in 1867, or has it become a matter of national and international concern since then? The second question is, has the law been scoped as narrowly as feasible in order to address that problem? The, word, the test uses the word single, distinct, and indivisible. The third part is, would the failure of any one province to act have significant effects beyond that province? In other words, is, is this a matter of real extra-provincial impacts? And then the fourth test is, if we gave this to the federal government, what effect would that have on the balance of power in, in the federation? Would this, would this disrupt federalism? And in this case, I would say that it was really a tension between those third and fourth tests. You've got a problem which in many ways is the poster child for a global problem, climate change. But at the same time, regulating to solve that problem reaches into many aspects of the economy which normally are regulated by provincial governments. And so both three and four of that test um, had significant implications here. And I'll talk about how the court resolved those. Before I do that, um, this is the boring part that actually is crucial, which is how does the court define the subject matter? And in many ways, the, the, the person that wins the framing of the subject matter of a case tends to win the case. So the federal government originally said that the subject matter, in other words, the power you're giving to the federal government is to address greenhouse gas emissions broadly. By the time they got to argument, they'd narrowed that a little bit and they'd said to address the cumulative, the cumulative dimensions of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in other words, it's not any one particular emission, it's the overall cumulative effect of those emissions. Saskatchewan took the position that this simply is a measure to increase the cost of fuels um, and should be treated as a matter of property and civil rights regulating the economy. The Ecofiscal Commission, which I represented, took the view that, that the subject matter should be seen as regulating to control extra-provincial and international pollution, um, building on a line of cases from the courts holding the federal government has power over interprovincial pollution. And then lastly, BC argued that it, it should be framed as the power to set minimum standards of price stringency for GHG emissions. So those are the four main options presented to the court for what the subject matter is. As you probably know, um, the court, at least three of the five judges, upheld the act under the national concern power. They first of all said that we are not going to give the federal government the whole area of regulating greenhouse gas emissions or regulating the cumulative dimensions of greenhouse gases, which was the federal argument. Uh, they said that would simply be too broad. It would give the federal government too broad of an ability to intrude into areas of provincial jurisdiction, because in effect, when you, when you recognize something as a matter of national concern, you're in effect adding that to the list of federal powers under the Constitution. What they did say is they're going to give the federal government a, bro a narrower subject matter, the power to set national minimum standards of price stringency for GHG emissions. By doing that, they've minimized the scope and reach of the federal government's power. They've allowed it to effectively address the cross-provincial and international problem by setting overall standards that will determine Canada's overall emissions and that all provinces are doing their share. That's really the national concern. But it also leaves provinces broad room to tailor their own laws to deal with their own economic circumstances in terms of how they're going to reduce emissions, how they're going to share the burden. Um, in the end, what they did is they struck an approach to federalism that's fairly similar to the one that we've used in Canada to deal with health care and social programs. This idea of national floor standards and then provinces being able to implement and lay out the details as long as they meet those national standards. 
Um, I will say that uh, this is a fairly novel approach legally, even if it's not a novel approach politically. There is no precedent in the case law for scoping the federal government's power under peace order and good government in this way. In other words, the, the limit on the federal power is a limit to set national standards. Up to now, they've mo mainly defined the national concern power in terms of cross-border problems, as opposed to the ability to set national standards. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a sound approach politically and policy-wise. In fact, it's how most federations deal with environmental issues. The, the nation, or in the case of Europe, the EU, sets the, the national standard that individual provinces or states can tailor solutions as long as they meet that. So it's an effective policy solution, even if it's relatively novel constitutionally and legally. I should add, by the way, since this is the Ecofiscal Commission, that the court did make an explicit finding on carbon pricing based on extensive evidence. They found that pricing is a necessary but not sufficient tool to reduce greenhouse gases. And they find that pr carbon pricing works. Uh, it has been effective in the places around the world where it's been used at reducing emissions and doing so cost effectively. Uh, let me just briefly talk about some of the other arguments that were that were made. Um, Saskatchewan spent a lot of time arguing that, that this law violated the principle, the unwritten constitutional principle of federalism. Uh, in particular, they argued that because it uses a backstop approach. It only applies in some provinces, and they said there is an unwritten principle that federal laws must apply uniformly across the country. Um, that didn't succeed. There are many, many examples of federal laws that are applied selectively. Um, the tax power, the majority found that the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, I'll just call it the act, is actually a regulatory charge, not a tax. So in constitutional terms, you have to be one or the other. You have to either be a regulation or price-based regulation or you're a tax. Um, in this case, they found it was a regulation because the purpose, primary purpose is not to raise revenue, but to change behavior. Um, however, they did say if it were found to be a tax, it would be constitutional. I'll come back to that in a minute because it matters for the dissent. In terms of the treaty power, uh, it's been held since a, a 1937 decision when our appeals went to the, the British Privy Council. They held the federal government does not have the power to implement the treaties it signs. Uh, that makes us virtually the only federal government in the world that doesn't have that power. And the court uh, didn't change that law. An appeal court couldn't overturn that decision. They did, though, recognize that the existence of a treaty is strong evidence that a subject matter is one of national and international concern, which feeds into the peace order and good government power. The criminal law power, people think of it, but in, in truth, many federal environmental laws have been upheld under the criminal law power, uh, federal regulation of toxics, federal regulation of endangered species, and recently, the, the federal low carbon, um, the the, the federal standards for bio-based fuels have all been upheld under this criminal law power. In this case, the court held this didn't fit under the criminal law power because under the criminal law power, the government has to prohibit things. That's the nature of a criminal law. And here, the law didn't prohibit emissions, it simply priced them. So they said mm -hmm. this particular law, pricing, doesn't fit under the criminal law power, although the federal government does have broad power over greenhouse gases. Um, under the criminal law power. It just has to prohibit things. There was an argument that this should rely on the emergency power. That was a, probably the most interesting argument. The court did find that climate change is an emergency, but there's also a requirement that it be time limited to use this power. You can't have a permanent emergency and invoke federal power, like a war is the analogy, and they found this is not a time limited emergency. And then finally, it was argued it falls under the trade and commerce power, and the court ruled, I think rightly, that this law was not drafted to address trade and commerce. Shift to the dissenters. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but they were the majority of the judgment in terms of pages. They were lengthy and somewhat rambling. Um, the dissent judges, the two dissenting judges out of five, um, made two basic findings. The first is, and they dealt with part one of the act and part two separately for constitutional purposes. So part one of the act is the actual carbon levy that puts a price on fuels. They found that part one of the act is a tax for constitutional purposes, not a regulatory charge. They found that its main purpose is to raise revenue and the behavior change was a secondary purpose. So they disagreed with the majority. They said this is mainly about raising revenue, not changing behavior. And they said, it being a tax, it doesn't meet the constitutional requirements of the tax power. 
for three reasons. One is Parliament hadn't clearly delegated its authority to tax to Cabinet. Taxes have to be imposed by our elected representatives. The second and main reason was they found that the powers delegated to Cabinet were far too broad. They hadn't circumscribed the powers of how to set the price. Um, uh, the majority disagreed with that, by the way. That was the main point of disagreement on the tax power. The majority judges said there are a number of parts in the Act that say the, the purpose that Cabinet must apply in setting price levels. And they found so they had given enough guidance to Cabinet to use a tax power. And finally, they found that taxes must apply uniformly across the country. The majority disagreed. And there are a number of examples of taxes that do not apply uniformly across the country. So that was part one of the Act in the dissent. The dissent judges found that part two of the act, which is the part specifically dealing with large industry emissions, is a regulatory charge, not a tax. It's more regulatory in nature because it actually sets emission floors for industry. But they found that it being a regulation, it must meet the national concern power, and they found that it didn't for a number of reasons. I've set them all up because, frankly, it's a fairly long and rambling explanation. Uh, I'll go through a few of them, but you see them there. One is to me, the most surprising finding is they found that greenhouse gas emissions are simply a, another type of air pollution and it's a local matter. And I think this reflects a basic misunderstanding of climate science, to be honest. Uh, they analogize greenhouse gas emissions to smog or smoke, which we knew about in 1867. And I think any scientist would tell you that greenhouse gas emissions are an atmospheric pollution, fundamentally different from local air pollution, but that was their finding. They found that um, the power to set national standards is actually not a narrow power. It's a fairly broad power in their view. And they made a third point, which I think actually is the one that has most weight in my mind. They said, you could argue that we need a, national, a power to set national standards for many things in Canada, but we have a division of powers that allocates between federal and provincial governments. So you have to say why this thing should be federal before you get to the issue of setting national standards. They found that provinces are fully capable of regulating greenhouse gas emissions and are doing so. Um, they, in their view, the real issue is the federal government doesn't agree with the provincial approach uh, to, to regulating emissions and with the stringency of that approach. They also found that giving this to the federal government would significantly intrude on provincial jurisdiction, giving the federal government the power to regulate many aspects of provincial economies. So that's the, the, the general gist of, of their dissent on that second issue. But this is the summary of it. I think this is important. The bottom line is that even the dissenting judges, while they found that this act as drafted is unconstitutional, agreed the federal government does have constitutional power to price carbon under its tax power, and Saskatchewan conceded that in argument, or to regulate greenhouse gases more broadly under its criminal law power. So there is no disagreement that the federal government can price carbon and can regulate greenhouse gas emissions more broadly. They just disagreed about whether this particular act uh, was drafted in a way that falls within the Constitution. Secondly, they agreed that carbon pricing works. And this is the quote uh, from, their, from their dissent. There is economic evidence that levies of this nature, a carbon price, whether a tax or a charge, can successfully affect behavior ch changes in consumers. So there was actually a fair amount of agreement on the bigger questions and issue. Uh, let me wrap up then. Where next? Everyone keeps asking this question. Well, so obviously the Ontario government filed a similar reference question. We've argued that before the Ontario Court of Appeal several weeks ago. Uh, I would we'll get a decision soon, uh, in, likely before summer. The Saskatchewan decision will not be binding, of course, but it probably will have some influence on the Ontario Court. I think it's very likely that both these cases will go to the Supreme Court of Canada. Major constitutional questions like this usually end up there. Um, we probably will get a decision sometime in 2020. Very unlikely it could be argued, let alone decided by the time of the election. Um, Manitoba has also filed a challenge uh, recently. It's a two-part challenge. Part one is a similar constitutional challenge. That may well be moot. By the time that would get heard, this case will probably be at the Supreme Court of Canada. But part two of Manitoba's case is as a judicial review. They also challenge how this act was applied to them. Even if it's constitutional, they argue that, that they should have met the equivalency test with their pricing scheme. So that part, the application of the act, probably can go forward. It uh, doesn't mean they'll win, but it can go forward. And then finally, uh, I'll, I'll open this up and, and people may want to get into it. I think 
you know, what if they were to succeed? What if they'd won this case? And what if they were to win in the Supreme Court of Canada? Uh, or what if, you know, what if in the election, uh, carbon pricing opponents were to succeed? What next? And I think, to me, the real question, the, the underlying question is, if you don't support carbon pricing, what is your plan to meet Canada's Paris target and build a low carbon economy? And what are the economic implications of those alternative measures? Uh, it would be good to get beyond simply fighting over carbon pricing and have a real debate in this Canada about alternative approaches for meeting our Paris target. Uh, and hopefully resolving these constitutional questions will let us move on to a, a, a real legitimate policy debate about how we reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build a low carbon economy. So that's probably enough from me. Why don't I turn it over to questions? And Annette, I think you're gonna stick handle those. Yeah, thanks Stuart. Yeah. Um, so if people can ask the questions via the Q&A in your screen, that would be great. Um, the, the first one, you can see it. Can you see the Q&A at the bottom of your screen? I think you should. I can only see the slide deck, but. Oh, so if you stop sharing your screen, yeah, okay. then you'll be able to see Q&A. Okay. All right. Okay, great. So the first question is about the, um, the arguments being raised. So, so far we know what Ontario said versus what Saskatchewan said. Do you have any comment on how their arguments differed and, and, and any thoughts on what uh, Manitoba and possibly Alberta will do? Yeah, good question. So Saskatchewan put a lot of weight on two things that Ontario didn't. They put a lot of weight on challenging the backstop approach, the fact that it didn't apply equally across the country. And they put a lot of weight on arguing this is really a tax power. Ontario did not argue it that way. Ontario's main, Ontario said, this isn't a tax. We agree. This is a regulation. Their main argument was that if you gave the federal government power over greenhouse gases under the national concern power, it would, it would disrupt federalism that it would give the federal government constitutional authority to reach into most areas of provincial economic activity. And they painted this apocalyptic list of regulating how many hours people could work, regulating how often industries could produce, shutting down industries. They kind of painted this apocalyptic picture of, of what would happen if the federal government had this power. But that was their main thrust. And, and I think, you know, if I were them, I probably would have argued it that way too. I think that's their strongest argument. We don't know Manitoba's argument yet. Um, all we know is that, that they've added this application about how the act is applied. And I think that will be the main issue in the Manitoba case, not whether it's constitutional. Okay. Um, so the next question, I'm going to go to the chat actually. So the question is that the majority opinion notes that its approach to the pith and substance of the act does not put at risk the constitutional validity of provincial initiatives to price GHGs, either through carbon taxes or cap and trade systems, paragraph 161. How significant is this finding for the future viability of provincial carbon pricing, especially if the federal government changes its approach after the October 2018 election? Yeah, that's a really good question. So what was really at issue in this case and the position Ecofiscal took was that from a policy perspective, the ideal outcome is having the federal and provincial governments both play a role on carbon pricing. If you look at Ecofiscal's reports, it has long advocated for a federal role uh, to set a minimum national floor, or that there needs to be a minimum national floor, but provinces should be able to tailor pricing and other tools to deal with the differing needs of their economy. So the fact that the court, all the parties agree that provinces also have authority over carbon pricing and greenhouse gas regulations, and the court's decision effectively found it was shared authority. Um, and so that's good. It's good for climate policy. It's good to allow for the different levels of government to play those different roles. And frankly, it's also good to have some, some policy, a certain degree of policy competition. If you look back to before 2015, provinces were the one leading the way on climate policy and carbon pricing, and the federal government was doing very little. And so having the province is able to do that. It's, it's known in political science literature as the California effect or the follow the leader effect, where one province or state gets out ahead and pulls others with it. And we might call it the BC effect in Canada. Um, it's a good thing policy-wise, and the court has accepted that constitutionally here. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, the next one is 
What findings from the Saskatchewan case or even the Ontario case might be useful to climate pricing advocates in the election? <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, the fact that it's constitutionally valid, obviously, but beyond that too. So the court recognized that, that climate change poses a major threat both to the environment and the economy of Canada and the world. Um, they recognize it's a, a massively important issue. They also found that carbon pricing works. They found that it's seen around the world as an essential tool to fight greenhouse gases, that where it's been used, it's been effective at reducing emissions and doing so cost effectively. And that was based on extensive evidence. And I should add that neither Ontario or Saskatchewan challenged that. Even though their political rhetoric challenged it in court, neither of them challenged the fact that carbon pricing works and is cost effective. Okay. Um, in your opinion, what was the strongest argument in the dissenting judge's opinion? Does that lend the Ontario government any support in their case? I mean, if I was, as, as a lawyer, you always think about how you'd argue the other side. Um, <laughs> and I, would, I, would, I would lean on two arguments, which I think, um, you know, at least one of which Ontario has emphasized. As I said, I, I would lean on the argument that that national concern test has four tests, right? And the fourth one is the scale of impact on provincial jurisdiction. And I think I would, I would I do what I'm trying to emphasize that if the federal government had authority over greenhouse gas emissions, that would give it very broad power to reach into many aspects of provincial economic activity, energy generation, transportation, cities, industry, buildings. Uh, and the courts have been very sensitive to using the national concern power in a way that maintains that balance of federalism. And so I think the real challenge for the federal government and their supporting parties in this case was how do you put boundaries on the federal power in a way that, that minimizes that scale, that potential for intrusion, but also gives them enough scope to ensure Canada meets its climate obligations and does so in a way that's cost effective and that all provinces do their share. So that really was the challenge for the court and for the parties is how do you put boundaries on this federal power in a way that makes it effective, but not so broad that it intrudes on provincial jurisdiction. I think, uh, I think some people were surprised that, that the Saskatchewan court um, used the setting minimum national standards as a way to define that boundary, just because it hasn't been used before by the courts to define the boundaries of the national concern power. It's a good policy approach, and I think we've advocated that eco-fiscal, but ultimately the question you have to ask is, for, to, to fit within the national concern power, there has to be something that makes this a problem that's federal. So for example, the federal government can't just set national standards for education. Even though education is important, it's an exclusively provincial power. So the real question is, what is it that makes greenhouse gas emissions a matter of national concern? And I would argue it's primarily the fact that they have a global impact. Um, and so I think in the Ontario case, the court's gonna have to wrestle with that. How do you put boundaries on the federal power? And what makes this a national and international concern as opposed to matters of exclusive provincial jurisdiction. Good. Um, we had a question via email that's related to this. They, they said that, that establishment, of, establishment of a minimum national standard isn't the same thing as the cumulative di dimensions of GHG emissions. Do you have a comment on that? Is that a question or a comment? Well, it's a comment, I guess. They said this is not the same thing as cumulative dimensions no, of GHG emissions. I agree. So, yeah, yeah so, um, so the court was very clear on that. What, yeah, so the they're court, saying, practically speaking, what is the difference? That's the question. Right. Okay, so the, the court did not accept the federal government's argument that, that it should be given power to deal with greenhouse gas emissions more broadly or the cumulative dimensions of greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at previous court decisions um, on the division of powers over the environment, they have given the federal government power over things like atomic energy, marine pollution, interprovincial water pollution. So they've, they've framed the issue somewhat more broadly. Um, the, but giving them power over all aspects of greenhouse gas emissions was too broad, the court ruled. And I think most parties agreed with that. Uh, in this case, the power is simply to set national minimum standards um, for pricing in this case. Uh, I think it kind of begs the question of, could they set national minimum standards using things other than a price? Could they have used 
um, a method that, that allocated the quantity of emissions that each province must, but must emit, as opposed to setting a price limit, because those are the two different ways to allocate burden in a federation. I think logically the answer has to be yes. The constitution probably doesn't say the federal government can use pricing as a tool, but not other mechanisms. If, if they have the power to set national standards, logically they have the power to do that either by a pricing or by quantity limits. But it's not a power, they said, to reach in and specifically regulate particular areas of activity. So the question the Chief Justice kept asking us is, could the federal government set standards for window energy efficient, energy efficient windows? Um, and, and clearly they were troubled by this issue. The federal government could reach in and begin to micromanage parts of the economy using this power. So that's how they drew that distinction. It's the power to set standards broadly to ensure Canada meets its targets and provinces do their share, not to reach in and micromanage specific parts of the economy. That said, the federal government could reach in and manage specific parts of the economy under its criminal law power. Um, it's done that, for example, setting biofuel standards that have been upheld by the courts. It simply can't do this under the national concern power. That's what this decision decided. Okay. Uh, the next question asks, is there anything in the Saskatchewan decision that speaks to interprovincial trade and the harmonization of carbon taxes on goods and services crossing provincial borders? No is the short answer. The court specifically found this was not a case under the trade and commerce power. Um, that said, they did find that one reason this was a matter of national concern was that there was a legitimate, in, a legitimate interest in moving towards a more harmonized approach or at least a coordinated approach to carbon pricing across the country. That was one basis of their decision. That's not a constitutional requirement but it was one of the reasons they felt there was a need for a federal rule to create a more coordinated, more harmonized system across the country. And uh, also to harmonize more, harmonize more globally. I mean, the court was clear that one of the factors in their decision was that there's a global treaty signed by all countries attempting to work in a coordinated global way to address this problem. And they recognize that because it's a global pollution problem, it requires that kind of global coordinated action by nations. Mm. Okay, the court found that GHG emissions or climate change did not constitute an emergency or, well, the time well, part of it. So the question is, does the finding invalidate the declaration of climate emergencies recently made by several municipalities, including many in Quebec? No, the court found that climate change is an emergency. Let's be clear on that. But there's two part test to be on the emergency power. The second part is it has to be time limited. The federal government can't call something a permanent emergency and take it over forever. The best analogy is they use the emergency power in times of war, um, and war is at least hopefully are not permanent. So they said, yes, it's an emergency. No, it's not time limited, so you don't qualify under that power. So it, 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 in, if anything, it actually reinforced the findings of some cities that there is a climate emergency. Uh, what was the interest of BC to intervene, and are they content with the decision? Well, you'd have to ask them okay. when, when a party wins and their argument is accepted, they're content. Um, BC's interest, and I think, you know, the interest of other provinces that have moved ahead pricing carbon is, first of all, they recognize that carbon pricing is a cost effective way to reduce emissions. But secondly, they want to ensure that other provinces are doing their fair share as well. BC, I think, in their argument said they're worried that they don't want to get way out ahead of everyone else and have other provinces in effect undercut them by having little or no price on emissions, uh, creating an incentive for industries to relocate to other places, essentially to create forum shopping based on the lowest cost of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for BC's approach to work, it's helpful that other provinces and other nations are also moving ahead with carbon pricing. And that's, I think, the nature of BC's interest. And I would assume they're pretty happy with the decision. Great. Uh, so, um, did the ruling touch on the legitimacy of provinces and territories using non-carbon tax instruments to reduce GHG emissions? Well, the court recognized that provinces do have constitutional authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, which people had always assumed, uh, and that they can do so by more than just pricing. They can do so by regulations. So, the court obviously wasn't ruling on what's a good policy approach, that's not its job, but it, it did recognize that provinces can do that. 
and it recognized that this is a shared jurisdiction, which is true for most areas of the environment. Most areas of pollution in Canada, air pollution, water pollution, endangered species, environmental assessment, have shared jurisdiction between the federal government and provinces. And so some of the rhetoric you hear in the media is, you know, the federal government is intruding on this exclusive area of provincial jurisdiction. And that's, you know, has no basis in the constitution. The courts have explicitly recognized for decades that authority over the environment is shared between the provincial and federal governments, that pollution does not respect borders. There is a role for national governments in dealing with the international and interprovincial aspects, and there's a role for provincial governments in dealing with the provincial aspects. And, and let's move on with how we share, rather than getting into bun fights about who has exclusive authority over the environment. So as you noted, uh, based on their interpretations, the two dissenting judges seem to lack a solid understanding of climate science, seeing GHG emissions as a local concern. Do you think this was a lack of understanding or did it reflect a political view towards carbon pricing? Do you anticipate a similar misunderstanding interpretation by judges in Ontario or at the Supreme Court? Well, uh, far be it for me to speculate about the Supreme Court's understanding. That's a career limiting move as a lawyer. Um, I can tell you, having argued the Ontario case, that I think the judges um, uh, worked hard and really did understand the nature of climate science. Um, there was a lot of evidence on that in the materials, and from their questions, they seemed to get it. Uh, so I, I don't really have a concern about that. Um, I think, you know, I, I won't speculate as to why the dissenting judges would have said that, but I, I just think all I can say is, is that, you know, it's fundamentally at odds with climate science. Um, to say that um, it's fundamentally at odds with climate science to say that greenhouse gas emissions are simply another type of local air pollution. There isn't a credible scientist, I would suspect, in the world who would agree with that, that these are emissions that go up into the upper atmosphere. A ton of emissions anywhere on the planet has the same effect anywhere in the world. It's fundamentally different from smog or smoke, which we knew about in 1867, both in its scale and its impact and its mechanism. Um, so it's just, it's simply wrong, I guess. It's, you don't usually say that as a lawyer, but it is, it's wrong. Okay. Is the output-based pricing system under part two of the act vulnerable as industry level regulation? Um, that is output-based carbon pricing defines different carbon costs for different products and production processes. Well, no, it was upheld by the court. So if, if by vulnerable, you mean constitutionally vulnerable, um, no, not based on, on this decision. Um, I think there's a recognition in the act and the court accepted it that large emitting industries um, need a different approach or at least certainly can support a different approach. And the approach in the act is that um, there are a number of, of industries that, have, that face competitive pressures that in other words, if Canada puts a price on greenhouse gas emissions that's significantly higher than our major, major trading partner, the US in most cases, that at some point, if that price gap gets big enough, it could begin to have competitiveness effects. We don't want, it can lead to what's known as carbon leakage. In other words, if you get to the point that, that some industries or new investment relocates to the US as a way of having lower carbon costs, then we still get the same emissions. We get all the downsides but we lose the investment in the jobs here. So what you want is you want a pricing regime that encourages Canadian industries to invest in being leaders in energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction. But you wanna do that in a way that minimizes the net cost to them of doing that. So you wanna have an incentive for efficiency and reduction, but, but minimize the total cost. And that's exactly what this approach does. It's what EcoFiscal has recommended in its reports. It gets at what economists call the marginal cost of emissions. To simplify it, as an industry, you are paying the price on the last 10 or 20% of your emissions, depending on the benchmark for your sector. Um, if you're a highly efficient producer, you may not be paying a price at all, but you still have an incentive to reduce emissions because every ton that you reduce, you can sell that as a credit to someone else. There's still an economic reward for every ton of reduction, but the total cost you're only paying on the last 10 or 20% of emissions. Um, so that's a good approach. It's an approach that creates an incentive for low carbon production, minimizes the competitiveness impacts, um, and the court upheld it. Okay. 
Uh, British Columbia's argument for setting the minimum standards of stringency for GHG pricing across Canada was accepted by the Saskatchewan judges. Did that save the federal government's case, in your opinion? And should the federal government be worried going forward that its framing of the pith and substance of the act wasn't accepted? Well, yeah, and I think um, those who support carbon pricing, including the federal government, are glad BC intervened and, and glad they made the argument they did. Um, it carried the day in this case. So, um, yes, I mean, I think there's no other way to put it that I'm sure the federal lawyers and, and others who support carbon pricing um, were glad that BC intervened and made that decision. In terms of looking ahead, um, you know, this was an important decision, but uh, courts don't always reach the same decision. The Ontario Court of Appeal will reach its own decision. It may use the same rationale that the Saskatchewan court did. It may not. It's, it is possible the Ontario court will uphold the law, but find a different reason for the federal national concern power. As I said, there were four different bases presented for finding this to be a matter of national concern. Um, I think the, uh, it's no secret because the argument was televised that the Ontario Court of Appeal also gave the federal lawyers a hard time on their framing in, in, in arguing that the federal government should have power over the full cumulative dimensions of greenhouse gas emissions. The Ontario Court also pushed back on that. So I would be surprised if the federal government doesn't reconsider that argument before they get to the Supreme Court of Canada because it's been rejected by one court and encountered a lot of resistance in another. That said, um, you know, the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal has recognized the federal government does have power under national concern. So, so it's really a question of how do you frame that power, not whether the federal government has the power. Okay. Does the way the court decided um, standards of stringency versus cumulative dimensions bar Parliament setting provincial caps or carbon budgets under national concern in your view? Sorry, ask that again. I missed the first part. Does it bar, does it bar Parliament from setting national caps? Caps or, or carbon budgets? No, not at all. I mean, I think that wasn't an issue in this case, right? Courts only decide what they're asked. So they were asked to, to rule on a law that used pricing. There's, so going back to Ecofiscal 101, there are two different ways to share to share the burden of greenhouse gas reductions and to define stringency or ambition. One is the quantity of emissions, which would be a cap. The other is the price on emissions. This law used price as a way to define ambition and allocate burden. I think logically, if the federal government has the power under the constitution to set national pricing standards, logically it probably also has the power to set national uh, cap on emissions and to allocate that cap across provinces. Um, you can imagine the political challenges of doing that. They might even be more contentious than trying to set a price across the country, trying to say, this is how much Alberta can emit, this is how much Quebec can emit. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to be the Prime Minister trying to have that meeting with the Premier, so uh, I won't wait into whether that's a good approach, but I think they probably could do it. And in a way that I want to just, there's a, a question that's popped up here too, which I think is an interesting one, which is, um, uh, do we have any idea what the conservatives will propose in terms of meeting those gas targets? Um, well, we know from a couple of conservative premiers. Um, so we know in terms of um, Saskatchewan has a climate plan uh, and it ironically does use pricing, but it only applies pricing to industry emitters. Uh, and then it uses a variety of other measures, uh, low carbon fuel, uh, biofuels, um, uh, uh, targets for renewable electricity generation um, as a way of reducing emissions. The Saskatchewan plan doesn't actually say whether it will reduce emissions at all, let alone um, how much it will reduce. It simply lists a number of measures. The analysis I've seen of it suggests that it may not actually reduce emissions at all by 2030. Um, it, it would make them less than they would have been. The Ontario plan, again, does the same thing. It actually does use carbon pricing, but it only applies it to industry. It calls it you know, a technology fund, but it's pricing by another name. But it also combines another, a number of other measures, such as uh, biofuels and, and other measures. Um, Ontario says that its plan will reduce emissions by 8% between now and 2030. Um, 
it hasn't added up how the plan would actually do that. So it isn't clear that it actually would, but it set that as a target. In terms of the federal conservatives, they had initially said that they would meet the Paris target. In fact, the, the minus 30 number was chosen by Stephen Harper. He was in power at the time that Canada had to pick its target under Paris. So minus 30 is a conservative target set by Stephen Harper. When there was a, a non-binding vote in Parliament on whether we should meet that target, the Conservatives supported meeting the Paris target. Um, but in recent months, um, uh, my reading of the media is the Conservative leader has hedged a little bit on, on whether or not he now intends to meet that target. So I don't have any particular insight. Um, obviously, I think anyone who cares about climate change hopes that they will. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having a debate in the country about how we get to our Paris target. That's a healthy thing in a democracy. We shouldn't be debating whether we'll be doing it, though. I think that there's this um, really the, the scientific conclusion is that we must meet the Paris targets and we must go beyond the Paris targets if we avoid dangerous climate change. And so we should be having a debate about how we get there. The debating whether we get there is not constructive. So hopefully we'll, we'll have that debate and we'll move past this political wrangling and get on to the real issues we should be discussing as a country now that this constitutional question has been answered by at least one court. Okay. Uh, so the next one I'm going to ask is, can you give one specific example of a federal law that is applied non-uniformly across different provinces? Um. Sure, lots of them. So a, a, a great example is this backstop approach was actually the approach that provinces requested in dealing with air pollution standards. There had been a federal provincial working group um, for several years that looked at things like sulfur dioxide, NOx, and particulates, important air pollutants. And at the end of the day, the provinces said, look, we'll agree on targets, but we want to know that if we meet our targets, other provinces are going to do the same. So they actually asked the federal government to bring in backstop legislation that would apply if a particular province didn't meet its targets. Um, endangered species does that. So the federal endangered species law has what's called a safety net. The federal government has the ability to apply its prohibitions in any province that does not have equivalent standards for endangered species protection. The Canadian Environmental Assessment Act um, has a similar equivalency provision that it can recognize a provincial law as having an equivalent environmental assessment regime and stand down the federal law. The Canadian Environmental Protection Act does exactly the same thing. It has an equivalency provision that says its provisions will not apply to toxics in any province with equivalent provisions. So this backstop approach is actually the norm in Canada for dealing with environmental problems. And it's a good approach. So I was glad the court upheld it. Okay, so I've got some revenue recycling questions. So the first one said, I think you said the court did not agree that the federal government has the right to set very specific standards on things like windows. However, the federal government does set efficiency standards on dozens of things. Oh, sorry. I see. Sometimes the question that I think I'm reading has popped up because there's another question underneath. Sorry, this is not revenue recycling. So, um, however, the federal government does set efficiency standards on dozens of things, appliances, furnaces, motors, lightning, lighting, sorry, cars. It sounds like the court decision did not recognize the current federal role in setting these standards. What's the difference? Ha, I like that question. I made that argument in the case. So the judge <laughs> asked that question. Right? That was my answer to the efficiency uh, question, is that the federal government has been in the business of setting energy efficiency standards for most of the appliances in your home, setting fuel efficiency standards for vehicle for years. Uh, and it's constitutionally able to do that. I think the difference is this that those laws were not passed under the national concern power of the constitution. They were passed probably either under the trade and commerce power in terms of dealing with appliances as a matter of interprovincial trade or under the criminal law power. The courts, I believe, have never ruled on what the basis is for vehicle fuel efficiency standards. It would probably be upheld either as a matter of their criminal law power, which upheld the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or as a matter of trade and commerce. So, yes, I think that's one of the, you know, when, when you look beyond the constitutionality and look at the whole regulatory toolkit, the truth of it is, and the court recognized this, that carbon pricing is essential, but it's not sufficient. And Ecofiscal has said this in its reports as well, that you actually need a basket of tools and a basket of measures to deal with climate change. Pricing has to be the foundation. It ripples through the entire economy. We live in a market economy. 
So having our, our market prices tell the truth about carbon costs is an essential underpinning of that shift. But we are going to need things like building codes, vehicle fuel efficiency standards, that pricing doesn't do everything. There's even a role for the federal government to provide um, incentives or investments where that's necessary and where it's done cost effectively. Um, and so there are a basket of tools needed. This case was just about the constitutional basis for carbon pricing as the most important tool. Okay, that's, you, you've kind of answered this next question on the revenue recycling, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. So if most carbon revenues are returned to individuals, the amount of funds available to provincial governments for renewable energy projects and other programs are significantly reduced. In some jurisdictions, including Quebec, most revenues are used to directly fund programs to reduce emissions. Does this mean that the federal policy in um, that federal policy in order to be constitutional must always reimburse or rebate most funds to individuals? So there's two different questions, right? One is how should carbon pricing revenues be used? And then the other is how are they used under this act? And obviously those are different questions. How are they used? Um, so the act says that there's, there's three options. Option one is a province has equivalent pricing of its own, in which case they keep the revenues and they decide what to do with it. Option two is province asks for the federal backstop to be applied in that province, in which case all the revenues from carbon in that province are given to the, to the province and they decide what to do with it. Option three is a province does neither. Uh, it simply does not bring a price or ask for pricing, in which case the law says the revenues must still be refunded to that province, but they can be given directly to individuals and businesses. They don't go through the provincial government. And so that's the case um, in Saskatchewan, in Ontario, in Manitoba. All of the revenues from the price collected from those provinces are recycled mostly in the form of, of, a, of a dividend um, to provincial taxpayers. So last week, the Parliamentary Budget Office um, concluded that the, the rebates um, in the provinces where the backstop applies for most households will exceed what they pay in carbon pricing. In other words, most families will come out ahead under the federal carbon pricing scheme. And those that reduce their emissions the most will come out further ahead. There's a second question, which is how should revenues be recycled? And I won't uh, wade too far into that one because it's really a debate about how government should spend your tax dollars. And that's the essence of democracy. Ecofiscal has a great report on that called Choose Wisely that looks at the different options. And basically on one end, there is the BC approach or the federal approach was to give it all back as income tax cuts or rebate. And let's call it the Quebec approach or the, uh, which is to, for the most part, invest it in energy efficiency, low carbon and public transit programs. And that's really, you know, a political debate, right? Should we be doing more to cut taxes or should government be doing more to invest in public programs that help that help help all people collectively? There isn't a right answer to that. Most are, most economists would argue that reducing taxes tends to be the more economically efficient solution, but it's also clear that that issues like infrastructure um, are public issues and do require public funding. So probably some balance of both is is not a bad answer. Uh, should we be concerned about the Supreme Court overturning this decision? And how likely is it that they could eliminate, eliminate a federal carbon tax? Well, it depends who we are. I guess if, if we means eco-fiscal or the federal government, um, obviously you don't want the Supreme Court to do it. Uh, you know, I won't get into guessing how the Supreme Court will decide a case that hasn't yet reached it. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, that the Supreme Court has heard challenges to a number of federal environmental laws in the last 40 years. It has upheld the federal law in every case, but in a couple of those decisions, it was a narrow one vote margin. Now that's, again, that goes to this case as well, by the way. Most big constitutional cases have a dissenting opinion. Uh, some people have tried to, to make a lot out of the fact that there was a dissent here, but that's normal. If there had not been a dissent, that would have been unusual. Lawyers disagree with each other. That's the nature of the profession. And, and judges like a good argument. I mean, often judges will write a dissent because they think that the other side of the argument should be heard. Uh, and there are two sides to these arguments, even if one is stronger than the other. So the fact that there was a dissent, um, you know, shouldn't be surprising in this case. In the Supreme Court, you know, there'll be a legitimate argument. These are important questions. Uh, the Supreme Court 
has been very clear in recognizing that environmental protection is a public purpose of superordinate importance. Those are its words. And environmental protection is one of the major challenges of our time. Those are, again, words from the Supreme Court. So they have recognized the importance of dealing with environmental protection, and their previous decisions have explicitly recognized the need for sharing power over the environment between the federal and provincial governments. Based on that, I think there's very little chance that the court would allocate exclusive authority over greenhouse gases to either the federal government or provinces. That would be inconsistent with all of its decisions for decades. It will want to find a way to share that authority, to let the federal government deal with the legitimately national and international dimensions of this problem, and let provinces have authority to deal with the provincial implications, including the implications on provincial economies. So it'll be wrestling with exactly the same issues the Saskatchewan court wrestled with and the Ontario court will wrestle with. And I think we'll, we'll come up with a decision that strikes the balance in a way that lets Canada do its bit in the global fight to, to tackle climate change, but also leaves provinces the tools to tailor that response to their economies. Beautiful. And I think with that, we'll wrap it up. It's just a minute to two o'clock. And I want to thank everybody for participating and you, especially Stuart, for giving us this uh, great in-depth uh, look at this court case ruling. And if anybody wants the PowerPoint, some people have asked if they could have access to it. You can just email me and I'll send it to you. Um, and the recording uh, will be made available as well if you would like. Um, I'll so, just add, if anyone yeah. had questions that we didn't get to, uh, mm -hmm. and feel free to email me. I, I, I have some trepidation in saying this. I don't want to flood them, but if we didn't get to your question, um, email me and I'll do my best to take a shot at it. Thanks. Good. And, and some people saying thanks. And, and so thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and with that, have a great day. Bye-bye.